A civil aviation plane was flying at high altitude. Just before landing, he told Rose that there seemed to be something in the cargo hold. Rose was puzzled as there was no indication of live animals on the airway bill. Then, the two and opened the cargo door, but found nothing, but as they were about to close the door, suddenly something violently crashed into the door. Rose was frightened and immediately stood up. In the next second, the door was hit and twisted. At this moment, the airfield controller noticed that the plane had not landed at the designated location and that the lights and radar were turned off. He quickly reported the situation to Bishop. Bishop immediately contacted Redfern via radio, but there was no response. The airport personnel who sensed trouble immediately called the police, and soon many government agencies arrived at the scene. F. A leader at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention was in the midst of a divorce due to long working hours causing family breakdown, just as the two were preparing to allocate their assets with the help of lawyers. F received a call from his colleague. After a brief explanation of the situation, he rushed to the scene immediately. Jimbo told F that the plane had been motionless for an hour and that no signs of life could be detected even with life detectors. It could kill 210 passengers within 10 minutes, and there was no other possibility except for the spread of a virus. So F and Nora put on level D protective suits and entered the plane. As soon as they entered the plane, the scene in front of them shocked them. They saw all the passengers sitting quietly in their seats, without any struggle or expression of pain. Soon, they made a discovery. Ammonia was permeating in the air. However, this wouldn't instantly kill the passengers. Then, F examined the body of a little girl, but found no clues. Nora took out a UV light. They saw green secretions all over the plane presumably left by some kind of organism. After discussing, they decided to split up. Nora went to the front of the plane, while F went to the back to investigate. F quickly arrived at the cargo door and shone a flashlight down, discovering that it was filled with green liquid. It seemed that something in the cargo hold attacked the plane, so F quickly asked his colleague to investigate the airline's cargo manifest. On the other side, Nora arrived at the cockpit and found that the cockpit door was open. She immediately reported it to her colleague. Upon hearing this, her colleague felt uneasy and asked Nora to leave immediately. But Nora, eager to find the truth, did not heed her colleague's advice. Just as Nora was about to examine Redfern's body, she found that Redfern and a few others were still alive. F told them that medical personnel were urgently needed. On the other side, Abraham saw the news about the plane and immediately sensed something was wrong. He then entered the basement and picked up a long sword made of pure silver. Slowly, he sat down in a chair with a jar containing a heart next to him. Meanwhile, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention isolated the survivors and questioned them about what happened on the plane. Redfern mentioned that his head was buzzing during landing, and then he couldn't remember anything. The same answer was given by other survivors. Unable to find answers, F had no choice but to investigate the cargo. To his surprise, there was a 3-meter tall, 1,500-pound coffin in the cargo hold. The coffin was carved with extremely strange patterns. What's even stranger is that this item was not listed on the airway bill. F instructed the staff to lay the coffin down, and then they all worked together to open the coffin lid. Inside, they found a pile of soil. This left F unsure of what to do, so he decided to have the soil analyzed. On the other side, Eichhorst arrived at Stoneheart Group. During the conversation between the two men, it was revealed that they were the ones who planned the incident. Their goal was to assemble a vampire army. The only thing left to do now is to get the coffins out. So, Eichhorst found Gus and asked him to drive a truck out of the airport. Following a specific route, they needed to reach Manhattan before sunrise. If anyone tried to stop them, they just needed to hand over the black card. As a reward, Gus's brother's criminal record would be cleared, and his mother's immigration status would be taken care of. Faced with such a generous reward, Gus agreed to participate. On the other side, a group of relatives of the deceased plane passengers had gathered at the airport. As the first person to enter the plane, F stepped forward to explain. At that moment, one of the relatives became very agitated and showed a photo, saying he wanted to see his daughter immediately. However, the cause of death of these victims was still unclear, and there were still some safety concerns. F could only promise to provide everyone with an answer within 48 hours. In the autopsy department of the CDC, Bennett reported clues to F. He discovered that all the victims had a 3-centimeter incision on their necks, precisely at a depth that would not cause the rupture of the carotid artery. 
Currently, no medical instruments could achieve such precision. What's even stranger is that there was no trace of blood in any of the bodies, but instead, a white liquid flowed out. These were the clues found so far. Abraham found F and claimed to know what this disease was. To stop this disaster, all the deceased must be beheaded, and then their bodies must be burned with fire. F was taken aback by Abraham's words and thought he was not mentally stable. He instructed the airport security personnel to take him away. However, Abraham refused to give up and shouted at F. The coffin is the key. Don't let the coffin cross the river. Nora was puzzled by how Abraham knew about the coffin. The coffin had already been sealed. Suddenly, a mysterious voice kept echoing in his mind. He asked his colleague next to him, but the colleague said they didn't hear any voice. Unconsciously, he walked towards an abyss and found himself in a tunnel. There was a creature crawling ahead. Just as he was puzzled, <laughs> A poisonous stinger pierced his major artery and started to suck his blood. In a matter of seconds, he was drained and turned into a lifeless corpse. But suddenly, the monster twisted his neck and smashed his head on the ground until it was completely crushed. After the event, the monster quickly fled the scene. Then it found the recently removed heart still beating in the autopsy room. He held the heart in his hand and examined it carefully, found a lot of nematode-like things on it, feeling nauseous. He dropped the heart on the ground, but by now his gloves were crawling with nematodes. Then it quickly slaps the nematodes off his hand, but it's still too late. The nematodes have already burrowed into his skin. Using surgical forceps, Bennett managed to pull them out. However, at that moment, all the passengers who had died earlier suddenly woke up. He was overwhelmed by a group of corpses, who began to bite and devour him. On the other side, F and Nora arrived at the plane's cargo hold, where they also found clues. Several nematodes were found entangled in the dirt at the bottom of the cargo hold. F immediately realized that this was the soil from the coffin. They quickly ran to where the coffin was supposed to be. But upon arrival, they discovered that the coffin was missing. F hurriedly went to the surveillance room to investigate. He found out that just seven minutes ago, a shadow quickly lifted the coffin away. This left everyone stunned and bewildered. At that moment, Nora remembered Abraham's words. Don't let the coffin cross the river. F had an uneasy feeling upon hearing this. He quickly called Jimbo and ordered a strict prohibition on any vehicles entering or leaving the airport. On the other side, Gus had already arrived at the underground parking garage of the airport. Following Eichhorst's instructions, he found a truck. After getting in, he noticed a strange large box, but he didn't think much of it. Just as he approached the checkpoint, he was stopped by SWAT officers. Then, Gus promptly showed them the black card given to him by Eichhorst, but the officers didn't know what it was for. At that moment, a police dog started barking furiously, and the officers immediately asked Gus to step out of the vehicle for inspection. Just as he was about to be exposed, Jimbo arrived in time. The officers handed the black card to him. Upon seeing it, Jimbo quickly told the officers that Gus was on their side. The officers, reassured by Jimbo's words, immediately allowed Gus to proceed. Jimbo approached Gus and asked him to relay a message to Eichhorst, saying that this would be the last time he does things for him. Gus drove towards Manhattan, unaware of what was being transported in the vehicle. On the other side, he was deeply saddened by the sudden loss of his daughter. But suddenly, his daughter opened the door and walked in. He couldn't believe his eyes. Immediately, he hugged her with excitement. Unaware that his daughter was no longer human, the two celebrated that the plan was progressing smoothly. This city would soon be occupied by the vampire army. Gus arrived at his destination before dawn. After parking the car, he got out and realized that there was no one there to receive the delivery. So he opened the trunk to see what he was transporting. Suddenly, the coffin started shaking violently, frightening Gus, who quickly left the scene. It is not known how long it had been, but someone discovered his body. F received orders to investigate. F asked his colleagues various details. Upon learning that he was killed he investigating the coffin, F immediately felt that the matter was not simple. Then he brought a UV light. After turning it on, he indeed discovered green slime similar to what was inside the plane. Just then, F received a phone call, a command from above to release four survivors. Since the source of the infection was not identified, F rushed to stop the he hoped everyone would stay and continue the quarantine. Some viruses have an incubation period, and if they spread to the outside world, it would be uncontrollable. Several survivors insisted on going home. Because of the orders from above, 
F had to let them leave. Then F went to the CDC and found his boss, wanting to persuade her to continue isolating the survivors until the source of the infection was identified. Unexpectedly, the airline declared the incident as a mechanical failure to protect its stock price. All passengers were said to have died due to carbon monoxide leakage, which made F furious and he directly scolded the leader, he was forced to take a leave of absence as a result. After returning home, found out his wife's next had moved in, he and his son were renovating the house, and to make matters worse, he had to pay the mortgage himself. But F did not lose his temper, due to his long working hours. His relationship with his wife had already broken down, but what he couldn't accept was that his son chose to live with his wife during the trial. This made F very sad, so he decided to give up his family and fully devote himself to work. Since he was forced to take leave, F decided to secretly investigate on his own. He made an appointment with one of the survivors, Redfern. Redfern felt guilty about the deaths of the other 206 passengers, so he decided to cooperate with F. First, F took Redfern to the hospital for an examination, then F used UV light to search for clues. He also found a 2cm incision on Redfern's neck. The next moment, F found many worms under his skin. This made F feel that something was very wrong. He quickly contacted Bennett from the autopsy department, but the call was not answered. F quickly drove to the autopsy department, and on the way, he received a call from a family member of a plane crash victim. The person expressed gratitude to F and said that his daughter had safely arrived home. F was stunned upon hearing this. The first thing he saw on the plane was his daughter's body. Before F could say anything, the call was hung up. Then F arrived at the autopsy department and found it empty. Bennett was nowhere to be seen in the laboratory. The body bags were open, and the bodies were gone. After the father put down the phone, he was preparing to bathe his daughter, he touched his daughter's head. But unexpectedly, a large clump of hair stuck to his hand. Before he could figure out what was happening, the next moment, he was killed by his daughter, who had turned into a vampire. In the bathtub, on the other side, they arrived at the location of the coffin. At this moment, the coffin was open, and he began to welcome the arrival of the blood ancestor.